If you have seen baby reindeer, I mean, how can you not? It's literally plastered everywhere at the moment. And also, if you haven't seen it, and you are the type of person that has a history of abuse and trauma, please do not watch it. So today's video, we're gonna dive into some deep psychology of why we actually go back to people that hurt us based on lessons that we can learn from baby reindeer. And also, why does it take us so long to recognize when we are being abused? I'm Danny De Silves, a self-improvement strategist for those who are struggling with no contact or low contact with their parents and when they get unstuck, they want to start healing and get ahead in life. Thriving from validation. Now in this popular Netflix series, you are going to see that Donnie, the main character, eventually does admit to himself that he does enjoy the compliments and the attention that the stalker Martha is actually giving him. Now let's think about that for a second because sometimes we find ourselves in endless abusive relationships with friends, with co-workers, partners for absolute years because even abuse is considered a form of attention. So let's think about that for just a second. If you've never received good attention in your past, maybe you have grown up with parents that were never emotionally regulating you. They never really celebrated who you were as a person. We were not emotionally nourished by our parents or caregivers. Well, our brain is constantly looking for that connection to get validation. And sometimes when we are not healed, we are, well, we're not our best selves, right? So we end up clinging to any form of attention, regardless if this is good attention or bad attention. And if we grew up in homes where we were surrounded by abuse, physical or emotional, then our brains have adapted to this pattern that it's completely normal to live out life on both ends of a toxic spectrum, meaning one day we might not get any attention from someone and that leaves us craving that attention and then all of a sudden we receive a crazy bucket load of attention whether it's good or bad and this soothes that craving for validation which as you can see becomes a vicious cycle which explains why we never know when we are being love bombed by a narcissist we really enjoy it and then one moment we're like hang on a second this is way too much now let's be honest for a second, we do know deep down when we are being mistreated, our body can sense it, we feel a little bit icky, we might not know how to describe that emotion, but something triggers these alarm bells in our head. And if we don't have a solid relationship around us to kind of guide what we should be feeling and what we shouldn't be feeling, we don't know whether we are in a good relationship or a bad relationship, and we don't have those good feelings and validation that we should have received when we were growing up. So this basically means we go back to that person that abuses us and mistreats us because maybe we are scared of being alone, codependence. We might feel that deep down we're no good, we are unloved and we are unwanted. And as you can see, as the series progresses, Donnie really admits to himself that he doesn't like who he is, he doesn't know who he is, therefore he is happy to accept this constant abuse from Martha because that makes him feel like a person, probably for the first time in his life. The dangle of the carrot. Let's talk about denying ourselves the reality of our abuse for a long-term game. So in the series around episode four, which is really hard to watch, we can see that Donnie is abused by his potential new future success. This is his co-writer, this person who's going to give him the dreams that he always wanted. And of course, at the expense of being abused in many different ways, as we can see throughout the series. So when we are someone that starts from a place of having these deep insecurities, low self-esteem and a lack of emotional support from our parents because as we've noticed his dad is a little bit emotionally closed off and then of course his mum is happy to date a man like that which goes to show that she is also emotionally closed off as well. Well we are more likely to live in a fantasy adaption of our own reality which basically means we strive harder for a career goal than dare I say the average person because that gives us success to keep on going. Now for example we may choose to pay for, let's say, software on our computers to write some music because that's our dream goal, instead of actually paying for bills that are overdue or food that we need to eat. We get this flawed sense of perception and we feel that our end goal is literally within reach and that it's going to happen no matter what. So we must do whatever we must have to do to get there, regardless if we are being abused. So you can see that Donnie in the series is denying the reality of his abuse because he's just holding onto the crumbs that his successful career is just going to spark any second. He's like, this is okay, I can forget about this, it's all worthwhile because one day I'm going to be a 
famous comedian and make it in the real world. And really, that end goal means that all of this crappy, sad, toxic life that we may have up until now is actually okay to ignore because when we get the thing that we are dreaming of, all of a sudden that pain is taken away. Now, we know that's not true, right? Celebrities will tell us all the time that fame means nothing. After, say, the first six months, you just go back to normal. You don't have that chance of getting rid of that pain. That pain is still there. And then you have all the paparazzi taking pictures of you and you never cry in peace. So really, we have to admit to ourselves that if we don't have this utopian end goal waiting for us, well, it's a cold, harsh acceptance of the reality that we are in, which, let's face it, we're probably not going to like. And this dangle of the carrot also explains why we hold on to relationships because we think one day it's going to get better, one day this person's going to change, one day this person is going to see me for who I am and they are going to love me in the way that I really want to be loved, when in reality they are not going to change. Now the sad reality is this, my friend, toxic people, they can sense this vulnerability in us and they are able to gain control and power over us by grooming us, abusing us. So they get what they want because, well, they know that we will not say no. They know that we are lacking boundaries and they also know that we are so desperate for that end goal. Now, I even have a video which does talk about why you may be easy to abuse. So please watch that video next because it's going to help you to identify some behaviors that you can quickly and easily start to change so that people don't walk all over you and you end up being your true high value self. So to wrap up this point, you might be stuck in a situation, right, where the abuser is saying to you, I won't do that again to you, honey. Next time things are going to be better. I'll go to therapy. I'll put the work in and maybe you are like, yeah, this is amazing. This is exactly what I want. And things may get better for the first one month, two months, maybe three months if you're lucky. But then that mask of that person is going to slip away, right? And then you're just cycling back round. But because you've had that chance where things were good, you end up striving for that dangle of hope. Like this person was good for three months and then they abused me for another eight months. But maybe we can go back to those original three months where things were great. It's that false sense of reality. Remember this, we are much more comfortable lying to ourselves than it is to admit that we are in a very crappy, toxic situation. Low self-esteem. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you've guessed right now that all of these problems stem from having low self-esteem. We don't realize until about eight months, nine months until we are past a big trigger point in abusive relationships. And we're like, ah, now I understand why I was attracted to this person and why they were attracted to me, yada, yada. So low self-esteem, which we can see in Donny throughout the whole of the series, is literally going to attract toxic people. When we feel that we are only accepted by narcissistic, abusive, terrible, toxic people. We don't actually believe there are healthy people out there that can better ourselves and make us feel great. So we end up stuck in this cycle of us being very low in our self-esteem, which attracts more toxic people. And we have to break that cycle. And if we don't, well, we just go into always be attractive to those lovely, dare I say, lovely toxic people. Low self-esteem also comes with a cluster of lack of boundaries, lack of confidence, the inability to stand up for yourself, you will be afraid of confrontation, and you will have that fear of applying yourself to pretty much any situation that you wanted, just in case things don't go your way, and then you have to actually admit to yourself that you were rejected, that you were not loved, you are not good enough, unwanted, whatever that negative critic is saying. And as we can see, Donnie gets those feel good compliments, gets that recognition from Martha. He gets abused by many different people in many different ways, but because his low self-esteem is telling him, you are worthless, so you don't need to tell anyone about this abuse. Also, these compliments feel pretty good, so you may as well stick around and take some more. Let's talk about toxic people and their endless giving. Yeah, that's actually not a normal thing for healthy, regulated people, dare I say normal. So a healthy, emotionally regulated person has boundaries for everything, their body, their possessions, their time, their mental energy. And if you do want a quick PDF download of all the boundaries that every healthy adult needs to be working on, then click on the link in the description bar. It's a free download. It's really cute. And it's a quick hack handy guide that you can actually set as your phone wallpaper. So if we are someone that has never started our healing work and we were never taught how to express ourselves and what boundaries were from our parents and caregivers, well, from a young age, we end up keeping 
keeping that almost immature mindset. We walk through life able to absorb everything around us. Now, despite what you may think, people pleasing is a toxic trait because deep down, we may feel like we just can't stop giving. We don't know when to say no to people. So we end up giving and giving. And that's because we don't value ourselves. We don't know that we can put a boundary down and say, no, I'm not going to continue to give. And of course, on the flip side of that, a toxic, unhealthy, abusive person also doesn't know when to stop giving and when to stop receiving. So let's take a look at the writer in Baby Reindeer. So we already know he's a very toxic, abusive individual, and he is endlessly giving to Donnie free career advice, gigs, etc. And obviously getting his way with Donnie too. But because he hasn't learned where his boundary of his physical self ends and where someone else's begins, this is why this dysfunctional relationship happens. No one is actually shutting it down and saying, no, you can't do that. So it continues. So we have one person that's happy to continue giving and giving no matter what they are giving and then there's someone else that latches onto that giving and they are happy to receive and to receive more which explains why we can be drawn to that love bombing narcissistic trait of people the narcissist can give endlessly generously lovingly and you think wow this is such a kind generous amazing person we would feel awful to question someone's big giving actions right well remember this a narc has a grand superior superior thought of themselves, so they will only ever entertain relationships with those people that support those beliefs, right? So if you seem to be attracting narcissists, we have to just stop for a second, scan ourselves and think, hang on a second. I'm leaving the door open here, aren't I? I need to work on my boundaries. So for an emotionally healthy person that's done their healing work, it actually makes us feel a little bit cringe. We're kind of like, ah, this person is giving me way too much stuff right here. I want to avoid this person and avoid this situation because something is not right. Now, this may make more sense if you consider yourself a spiritual person. So if we look at the universal law of energy, whatever it is, we give out to the universe and then we end up making that thing happen. For example, if you are happy to chase for a romantic partner, the universe is always going to give you relationships where you have to keep on chasing, meaning you end up dating someone that could be potentially avoidant because that reinforces that chase energy. So when we are a healthy, regulated person, when someone continuously chases us, it makes us feel very uncomfortable. So if you are someone that sat there for hours and hours and you've been able to offload to someone and this person's just sat there nodding and and smiling and taking it in and you've only just met that person eventually you're going to get that sense of hang on a second this is a little bit weird this person lacks boundaries because they are listening to me drivel on about i don't know worm composting warhammer whatever it is and i can tell they don't really like that subject but they're just lapping it up anyway to make me feel good that person may be agreeing with every single thing that you said they may drop any plans that they have at last minute just to hang out with you they will never say i like this i don't like that they are just happy to do pretty much whatever whenever you say and this is the trick when we've done our healing work, when this situation happens, we're a little bit like, oh, the, yeah, you're a little bit emotionally needy. I'm going to have to distance myself because whatever this is, isn't working for me. You go back out of fear for the worst. Now, this is a pinnacle reason why we go back to abusive people. Sometimes we can be so unlucky that we are stuck in a situation where we fear that things will become extremely unsafe if we leave this toxic situation. We may actually aggravate the abuser by leaving. Maybe they have financial control over us. Maybe we have children together. It's not always easy to leave traumatic, abusive relationships. It's not as simple as just a physical detachment, throw your belongings in a box and go there is emotional substance too and sometimes the emotional attachment is actually what's keeping us bonded with a toxic person so of course you may end up staying in a relationship or situationship for longer than what is absolutely necessary because we don't feel there is a safe way out if we've never met safe people so far in our life 
well, they, we don't think they exist. So of course we're not going to leave because that whole world out there is pretty scary to do it on our own. So what happens? We go back to this person, we fawn over them, we appease them, we do whatever we need to do to keep them happy, even if it means shutting ourselves down in the process. And we begin to believe our own lies. Things are okay. This abuse won't happen again. I can ignore it. Everything's going to be okay. Whatever they've said, I can work through. They've apologized. I just have to accept and move on and you don't really have to do that at all so when we look at Donnie in the series well he doesn't report Martha for many months even years because he feels this ounce of guilt and shame for reporting her because he's starting to build this deep bond with her so let me explain the Stockholm syndrome story to you it's actually based on a real-life hostage robbery situation took place in the 1970s in short a woman fell in love with a guy that basically made her a hostage and as he robbed a bank yada yada the main line here is she ended up supporting him through this kind of abusive situation and then turned herself against the police and the authorities to stand up for him trying to make out that the hostage situation was okay and they eventually formed this deep bond now this isn't trauma bonding and it's not an official diagnosis for anything but it highlights how we have this lack of control with someone let's say someone has a higher form of power against us what we end up doing is lessening ourselves we fawn because we are scared of what's going to happen next so we feel the only way out is to keep my abuser happy. If someone is as dangerous to the potential of actually physically harming us or even our social reputation, well, we end up sticking around and forming a bond with this person, maintaining this relationship for that fear that something is going to be majorly wrong if you turn your back on them and if you end up antagonizing them in any way. And if you are dependent on someone for your basic needs, such as food, water, social connection, such as the lady who was kept hostage, you're more likely to build this codependent behavior and fall for your abuser. Now, deep down, see this as a coping mechanism for survival. And we can see that played out between Donnie and the stalker, Martha. He's lonely. He's barely surviving in his life. He's dealing with so much deep psychological problems and issues that he's a striving comedian. He has a face career he's surrounded by a lack of good friends and his co-workers let's be honest were very jokey not deep people and they weren't that emotionally soothing and validating when they learned how dangerous Martha was so for him it becomes easier to just shut down from a survival coping mechanism and deny how dangerous Martha actually is because it's much easier for him to sweep things under the carpet than it is to deal with the fact that Martha is a dangerous woman and of course we don't know to what lengths of extremity she she would go to to get control back over Donnie if he did report her. Deep down, we may not believe that we deserve to be surrounded by loving, supportive people. And like I said before, we might not even realize that these people exist because we've never met them before. They're like aliens on another planet. Now here's the kicker, right? When we eventually realize, and this is kind of, I guess you would call it the, the dark night of the soul when it comes to healing. A lot of people don't actually talk about this. And this is what actually scares people from starting healing is that when you unlock this Pandora's box of tricks and you're like, okay, let me start understanding why I am a people pleaser, why I'm into codependent relationships or why I'm the toxic person. When we open up this can of worms, it springboards off every single negative thing that's happened. It brings up a lot of cringe moments a lot of moments where we're like oh so because I'm like this in my relationships I can see I'm playing out the same dynamic that my parents have and then their parents had and how this just kind of takes over everything in my life so it's very uncomfortable because when we admit something very I guess small for example Donnie and the Martha situation we start to unlock how this is negatively affecting every single crack and crevice in our life and that is so uncomfortable to deal with so it's just a lot easier to pick up that rug and just boop, sweep everything underneath it blaming ourselves now i want to highlight this really heartbreaking scene where donnie has that courage to confine in his co-workers and he explains the endless emails he's been receiving from martha but instead of them supporting him and actually seeing how distressed he was and validating what he's going through because remember up until now this situation has not been emotionally validated and donnie has a very flawed sense of perception of what is a good thing and what is a bad 
bad thing, so this situation is made completely worse by them replying to one of the emails in a very vulgar way, which then just spurs on more sexually graphic emails and tells Martha this is a green light, everything's gonna be okay. So then when Donnie does go to the police and reports the stalking behavior, well, the police don't take that situation seriously because, well, they're seeing the email that was sent to Martha. So understand this, it's really important to see that Donnie feels like he is to blame for this situation. So when we reach out, when we have this sense to think, I'm being abused, I feel very uncomfortable, we need to be validated very quickly because if we're not, we blame ourselves. If we receive a negative response from talking about the abuse, for example, to the police or to the, the co-workers, well, this abuse therefore becomes internalized. And then it's a lot harder for us to recover from this abuse because, well, we have this toxic shame when we try to support it. We've tried to get validation, we've tried to leave, and someone's turned around and said, this really isn't that much of a big deal. So you're like, oh, right, and you just keep it in and shut it down. And we can see this again when he has that chance to actually go to the police to report Martha physically assaulting Terry, his girlfriend, or himself when she smashed a glass on his head. You can see that he has this moment like the angel and devil situation where the bar staff explained, yeah, this is gonna be pretty bad for his buddy if the police get involved because there was no manager on shift, the cameras are faulty, etc. It's not looking great for us. It's going to affect everyone negatively. He's gonna feel a lot of shame. He's not gonna be able to live with that guilt. For example, he's not told Martha to F off so far because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings but he lets himself get hurt in the process and it's very common for a person in an abusive relationship to actually say cheat on the abusive spouse because they are lacking this emotional intimacy and then the abusive spouse finds out and what happens is the abused person feels so guilty about their own behavior which of course is understandable that they then feel they deserve to stick around in this abusive relationship even longer because they have this horrible feeling of shame low self-worth and guilt, and they feel like I spurred this on, therefore I deserve to be punished. The stigma of abuse. Yeah. The moment that you admit to yourself that you have been abused and that you are in a toxic relationship or situationship, we then have to deal with the sad reality of the stigma. So Donnie says that he feels less of a man because he was abused by a man. He becomes confused about his own identity, who he is because someone took a part of him, his control. This applies to women too. A woman feels this sense of less self-worth and no identity anymore because someone has taken something from her, the control. So we live in a society that we could say has been created for men by men and a man that has been abused no longer will feel like he is a part of society so therefore when we have this mindset that you want to escape the abuse you then feel like you have to fake it and blend in with the rest of society and bottle down those emotions that you feel that it feels so uncomfortable to do that that it actually feels easier to just go back to the abuse and the toxic situations because because that's familiar and predictable and almost a lot less scary. And I'm delicately saying this, but a lot of times when a woman is abused, a lot of people may say, well, she was asking for it because of what she was wearing. So when we receive this negative feedback from our abuse, when people are not validating what we went through and say, wow, what you went through was awful. I'm so sorry for you. You did not deserve that at all. An abused person may go to their parents. They may go to their friends and say, hey, I'm in an abusive relationship. This has happened and this has happened. Friends and family may mock you. If you are a man and you are abused by a woman, they may say, well, you know, women is just a punch, yada, yada. Or maybe they will say, well, he's only hit you once, things are fine. Or people don't understand what emotional abuse is. So they won't understand that if you're not being physically assaulted in a relationship, then it can't be toxic and abusive. So like that previous point, it reinforces the fact that something is wrong with us when people don't 
don't give us the validation that we deserve. Therefore, we're more likely to go back to the abuse because we're so confused about, is this a bad situation? It's just me that thinks this. And there is a huge amount of shame when you admit to yourself that what happened to you was not quite normal. There's a huge amount of shame when you question yourself, why didn't I try to stop it? Why didn't I walk away from that first red flag? Now, shame is a horrible, 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 icky feeling, and it makes us feel excluded from our tribe or society, our friend group, our family, our hometown, and it's so much easier to lie to ourselves and stay in a toxic environment than it is to admit our shame. But it can, it really can be worked through, okay? It does take time, it takes patience and a lot of kindness and surrounding yourself with people that understand the extremity of deep, deep healing. And of course, learning to love ourselves again. Now I'm sending you so much love. And if any of the points from today's video personally resonated with you, please know this, you're not going through this alone, okay? When you are ready to talk about it and then you can act on it, you can start taking your first baby steps to freedom and your happiness. And if you could be so kind, like the video, leave your comments so the old YouTube algorithm does its thing. And I will see you next time. Be kind to yourself.